Oh, may God teach you the meaning of that name, Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, it is wisdom's mystery, God with us. Sages look at it and wonder. Angels desire to see it. The plumb line of reason cannot reach halfway into its depths. The eagle wings of science cannot fly so high, and the piercing eye of the vulture of research cannot see it. God with us. It is hell's terror. Satan trembles at the sound of it. His legions fly apace. The black-winged dragon of the pit quails before it. Let Satan come to you suddenly and do you but whisper the word, God with us, and back he falls, confounded and confused. Satan trembles when he hears that name. with us. It is the laborer's strength. How could he preach the gospel? How could he bend his knees in prayer? How could the missionary go into foreign lands? How could the martyr stand at the stake? How could the confessor acknowledge his master? How could men labor if that one word were taken away? God with us is the sufferer's comfort, is the balm of his woe, is the alleviation of his misery, is the sleep that God gives to his beloved, is the rest after exertion and toil. God with us is eternity's sonnet, is heaven's hallelujah, is the shout of the glorified is the song of the redeemed, is the chorus of angels, and is the everlasting oratorio of the great orchestra of the sky. God with us.
just you the riches of this world could never satisfy let my heart want for only you for me for me only Jesus for me continue on talking about the Christmas story. And as I told my Bible study group this morning, what we've been trying to do with the Christmas story is to look at it with, with fresh eyes, from a new perspective, kind of outside the box, if you will. We talked in week one uh, about, uh, we started in a weird place. We started actually in Isaiah uh, chapter seven. You're like, well, wait a minute, this Christmas story isn't there. Those are in the gospels, buddy, not Isaiah seven. But we talked about King Ahaz. We talked about the entire thing that sets everything off, this prophecy that Isaiah gives to King Ahaz, that there will come a child who will be born to a virgin. He will be called Emmanuel, God with us. That sets everything up for what we've been talking about. Last week, we talked about the shepherds. We talked about God's surprises and how God surprises these shepherds in this wide open field and how he continues to surprise us today. And today we're going to land in a very familiar spot, but we're going to look at it in a very different way. Matthew chapter 2 is where we are this morning. We're going to be talking about the Magi. We're not going to waste any time this morning. We're going to get right into it. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. Stop. Do you notice anything here that's different than the other gospel accounts of Jesus' birth? That's it, guys. That's it in Matthew chapter 2, like half of a verse, not even a full verse, half of a verse about Jesus. And again, Matthew does a great job of setting it within history during the reign of King Herod. 
And about that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem, asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed. I was telling a Bible study this morning, that is actually a very light term there. He wasn't just disturbed, he was terrified. King Herod was not only paranoid, but he was terrified that there was a legitimate born king to the Jews, as was everyone in Jerusalem. And he called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. Micah 5.2 is what he's quoting here, or what they're quoting. And you, O Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned that, uh, from them the time when the star first appeared. And then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Phooey. This guy ain't about worshiping any newborn king. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were filled with what? Joy. Now the word there is, again, a very light use of the word joy. The word actually means exceedingly great joy. And do you know why they had exceedingly great joy as they show up and they see this child? Not because they finally get to worship him, that's one thing, but because these dudes have been walking forever, and they're like, this trip has come to its completion. Thank you very much. Then they entered the house, and they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, and everybody's getting their heads right now, right? Like the the Hallmark card, like, oh, the three kings and the silhouettes and the desert and the star. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. And again, here in Matthew 2, What we have is we have moved beyond the manger. There's no birth, there's no nativity, there's just a passing reference that Jesus has been born. But there is a fascinating, and this is what we just read, is a behind-the-scenes look at what is happening around the birth of this child that has been born the king of the Jews. There's a confrontation between Herod and the Magi that takes place that injects a new perspective into the early story of Jesus. The question that most people will ask, and we're going to spend a little time this morning, but this isn't really my full focus this morning, is who are these magi? They're kind of mysterious. They're kind of strange. They kind of come from nowhere. Who are they? Um, Short answer. Don't know. There is very little that is known about these mysterious figures that we know as magi, and that really is the best term. They are not kings. But they are, and the word is used here is actually the Greek word magoi, magi, magicians. They came from um, a place in an area that was probably uh, Persia at that time, or maybe a place that was even further east, it was called Parthia. Uh, And if I had a great map up here, I don't have a map of that, you would see that it is a tremendous distance between Jerusalem and Persia, Parthia. They, they combined, these guys were very good at combining astronomical observations, so they loved to look at the stars. They were stargazers, and they loved to combine that with astrological speculation. So they looked at the stars, and they said, this is what I think this is trying to tell us. Now, let's get past this right here. They are not like the astrologers that write in the newspaper, all right, or write online and give these goofy little predictions about things. These guys were smart. They were scholars. They had their stuff together. They played both a political and a religious role in the land that they came from. They were very, very important and very prominent figures in their land. And and here's what we have to understand about this concept of astrology. You know, most of us today are like, (laughs) astrology, like what's that? But back in this culture, at this time in the ancient world, people lived their lives by astrology. 
So it, it's not surprising when, that when some new astronomical happening took place, it was reasonable so, to suppose in people's minds that God was doing something. The gods were doing something. They were breaking into the ordered world and they were making some kind of new news known to everybody. So here's a secondary question. We don't really know much about the Magi. What exactly what were these wise men seeing in the sky that led them to go to Jerusalem? Again, I don't really know. I don't really know, but there is some very interesting speculation around what they possibly saw that would lead them to Jerusalem. There's no way to perfectly explain what would cause these men to embark on the journey they did, but one interesting and very strong possibility lies in a three-part phenomenon that happened in about 7 BC. Now, I probably have to clear this up too, because sometimes people are like, well, obviously, if it's BC, then, then Jesus didn't exist, because that means before Christ, right? Uh, well, it didn't, and because of a bunch of calendar rules and a bunch of calendar things, Jesus was actually, they believe, probably born somewhere around 6 or 7 BC. And in 7 BC, there was something that happened three times that would fit well with the story of Jesus. The most probable suggestion for what caused these astronomers, these stargazers, and caught their attention was not the presence of a single star, but the conjunction of two planets, Jupiter and Saturn. And it, and it happened in an area of the sky, and I know I'm telling you a lot of scientific stuff, and you're like, dude, I'm falling asleep here, all right? Stay with me, because this will matter in about two minutes. It happened in an area of the sky known as Pisces. That's what they called it. That's where the star showed up. That's where this conjunction of planets happened. It's documented. It is historical truth that this happened in 7 BC three times on May 29th, on October 3rd, and on December 4th. And I don't, I don't want to speculate further and call it a coincidence. Somebody's birthday, this guy, is on May 22nd. I mean, just slightly before May 29th. And my anniversary falls just days after that last date on the 23rd. I mean, think what you will, but there's something really special there. Really, really special. Now, in all seriousness, though, guys, this is significant in 7 BC. Because I, I don't know if you've heard the literally astronomical news. Get, guess what is set to take place this year? December 21st, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn are to come together again in a way that they haven't in over eight hundred years. So close that they, it'll almost look like they're touching. They will, they will almost merge together. They will sit just a tenth of a degree from one another. The amazing conjunction is known as what, guys? Have you heard what it's called? The Christmas star. Just interesting stuff that happens. If this is what arrested the attention of these stargazing magi, it's not really difficult to see how they would have interpreted it. Again, Pisces, that area of the sky that I told you about that this happened in, was, was thought by astronomers to mark the end of the sun's old course and the beginning of a new course. Jupiter itself, the planet itself, was known as the royal planet. Saturn had long thought to be the symbol of Israel as a nation. Are you seeing all this start to come together? Royalty, Israel gigantic star, the beginning of one thing, the, the start of a new thing. So this conjunction of planets gives the impression of one really bright star. It, it would have meant to the confident and the astronomer that's paying attention that a new age is beginning, in which the sovereignty of the world is going to shift to Judea. Guys, Jerusalem was the capital of Judea, and it's natural. You go, like, why in the world do they show up in Jerusalem? Like, Jesus is in Bethlehem. Well, think about this for a minute. If you're going to show up and you're like, something is happening in Indiana, where am I going? You probably ain't going to Connorsville, all right? I'm just, I'm just saying, love Connorsville. Where are you going? I'm going to Indy. It's happening in Indy. That's where I show up. That's why these guys show up in Jerusalem. And here's what happens with these guys, and here's what I believe partly is what's happening here. They would have started this journey, this travel, at the first conjunction of these planets in late May. Now, I don't, I don't want to be a bubble burster here, okay? And I want to explain this. We do realize 
that Christmas probably didn't happen on December 25th, right? Okay, I just wanted to get that across. In fact, it probably happened more like at the end of May. That's when Jesus was born. So these guys set out at the first conjunction of these planets in May. I think that they saw the star again in October. And the third would have occurred while they were in Jerusalem and they went to Bethlehem. I mean, it seemed almost overhead and it indicated to them that the end of their search was at hand. Whew, guys, we can stop walking. But I, I know what you're saying. I know what you're thinking. R Ryan, this all sounds very scientific. Sounds great, sounds wonderful. You've really put this together well, but that's science, dude. We're talking about God. I mean, it, it does sound like that, right? Very scientific. But is it possible, stay with me, that God can completely use the laws and the happenings of the universe that he created to announce his plan? Absolutely it's possible for God to do that. He, like I said, is the one who controls all of it, who created all of it. All the rules of our universe are at God's beck and call. After all, there's plenty of scriptural precedent about this kind of thing happening, almost exactly and eerily similar in the way that it's recorded in Matthew chapter 2. I want you to turn, if you would like, or go to on your device, Numbers chapter 24. And I know what you're thinking. Numbers 24 doesn't fit with Christmas. Oh, yes, it does, my friends. Numbers 24 tells a story of a man that you'll probably remember very well. His name was Balaam. What's so special about Balaam? Balaam had a talking donkey, didn't he? But Balaam was also a prophet and a seer, and he was summoned by Balak to curse Israel. And in Numbers 24... Balaam has this prophecy, verses uh, 16 and 17. Tell me if this sounds sort of familiar. The message of one who hears the words of God, who has knowledge from the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who bows down with his eyes wide open, and then the rest of this is on the screen. I see him, but not here and now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. Now focus in right here, this last part. A star will rise from Jacob. That's the name for Israel. A scepter will emerge from Israel. It will crush the foreheads of Moab's people, cracking the skulls of the people of Sheth. Does that seem sort of familiar and sound like something that you just heard a little bit ago in Matthew 2? A star rising over Israel. It seems to me that these magi in Matthew 2, these wise men, were the, in some way the successors to Balaam. They witnessed the fulfillment of this prophecy hundreds of years prior. Guys, it's no coincidence. Listen to this, please. It is no coincidence that in life, for every single one of us in here, for those who are watching at home, God meets us exactly where we are. He knows what we're dealing with. He knows how we see the world. He knows our perspective as a life. And he says, I'm going to meet you right there. But he doesn't seek to just leave us right there. He wants to move us from there to deeper and more meaningful truth. That's exactly what he does with these magi. Oh, you guys want to look at the stars. Oh, you guys want to interpret the stars. Let me use that. and I'm going to lead you to something even greater than those stars. This, this special revelation that these guys get that makes them go on this journey may, may simply have just been something in the sky. It may have been purely scientific. Or this revelation could have come through some sort of contact with Jewish scholars who had migrated to the East with copies of the Old Testament manuscripts. As you remember the story of the Old Testament, don't you, right? Where do the Jews get exiled to eventually? It starts with a B. It ends with an Abalon. It's a Babylon, all right? That's in the East. It, it, is it too much of a stretch of the imagination that when they all came out of exile and went back to Jerusalem, that some of them said, you know what, we're fine here, actually. We're just going to stay right here. Is it, is it possible that these guys, I think it's very possible, it's very probable, they had influence on who become these magi. You remember a guy, right, don't you, in, in, in Babylon? He started with a D, and his, his, his name ended with Annual. Yeah, he's a pretty big dude, like, in, in the empire. 
Like he was like second in command in the empire. Do you not think that Daniel had some sort of influence over people? They, these guys are mentioned in Daniel. Magi. Magicians. Do you not think that Daniel influenced the magicians who would influence the next generation of Magi, who would influence the next generation of Magi? Guys, there is something about, they, they have knowledge about God's work and plan that they shouldn't have. God is working and he's spinning a plan greater than any of us can imagine. It is uncanny how the Magi's comments bear a resemblance to Balaam's prophecy, a star that would come out of Jacob. But the similarities don't end there. Isaiah also talks about this again. Isaiah chapter 60, if you would turn there. Go to there on your devices. Starting at verse 1 says this, Arise, Jerusalem, let your light shine for all to see, for the glory of the Lord rises to shine on you. Darkness as black as night covers all the nations of the earth, but the glory of the Lord hold on to that for just a minute because we're going to come back to it, rises and appears over you. All nations will come to your light. Mighty kings will come to see your radiance. Look and see, for everyone is coming home. Your sons are coming from distant lands. Your little daughters will be carried home. Your eyes will shine and your heart will thrill with joy. For merchants from around the world will come to you. They will bring you the wealth of many lands. Vast caravans of camels will converge on you. The camels of Midian and Ephah. The people of Sheba will bring what? Gold and frankincense, and will come worshiping the Lord. What does that sound like to you? It sounds a whole lot like a Christmas story to me. Here is what I think. I do think there's some scientific stuff going on here, but I think there's a whole lot of supernatural stuff going on here too. I think there's a mix of the two coming together. And what I really think weighs even more is, could it be that the star which the Magi saw and which led them to the specific house in in Bethlehem was the glory of God. Talks in the Old Testament all the time about the Shekinah glory of God that lights up the sky. You know that God is there. The same glory that had led the children of Israel through the wilderness for 40 years as a pillar of fire and cloud. Perhaps this was what they saw in the east and What they want, what they called it, for lack of a better term, was a star. Again, since this is how these guys are naturally dispositioned to look at stars. And God says, okay, if you want to look at stars, I'll give you a star. Because whatever the case may be, it's clear from Matthew 2 that the Magi didn't always have this star to direct them. Again, why do they show up in Jerusalem? They're in the wrong spot. It's in Bethlehem that you need to be in. Ken, I think, May, oh, there's a star. Let's start following that. Okay, we're just going to keep on going on that path where we saw it. I don't, it's not here anymore. It's not really visible to it. Oh, October. Well, there it is again. We're on the right path. We're going where we need to be. We're getting close. We're getting close to where this king is supposed to be born. Naturally, let's go to Jerusalem. That's where the capital is. We should expect that. And could you imagine how defeating it is, guys? You show up. And you say, where is the newborn king of the Jews to be born? And what did they get when they got there? Who? Who are you, who are you talking about? That's, that's the point right there. I've been like, just pack up the bags. We're going home. Like we, we've come all this way, and nobody knows anything about it. It's like going out, and, and, and you want to visit your favorite like, amusement or theme park, like, man, you've been saving up for all year, and you got to go cross-country to get there. And you get there, and you're like, oh, it's, it's closed. What's that sound like, guys? Yeah, it's called Christmas vacation. That's, that's, this is kind of like Christmas vacation before Christmas vacation. Like, you don't know who we're talking about? Like, dude, hey, closed. We don't know what you're talking about. I would have been, been done. I would have been done at that moment, but not these guys. And what I do not want you to miss out on this morning, what I really want to focus in on, take the science part of our lesson, putting that away. We're going to talk about some faith now. Take out the questions of the star and how it happened and all of the minutia that we could get bogged down in about the Christmas story, and I want you to focus on the radical determination of these guys to see the newborn king of the Jews. Nothing was stopping them. In fact, that is the single-minded mission 
of this group of scholars. Do you catch it again there in Matthew chapter 2? The purpose for why we came is to worship the king of the Jews. Magi, the Magi ask this question, and they frame it around the construction of all of it around the word born. The construction of it and what they're really saying here and what God is trying to get across is that, Herod, you are illegitimate. There is a legitimate king who has been born to sit on the throne of Israel. A new star in the sky was often believed by people of this time to herald the birth of a significant person in the land over which that star shone. And so off they journey. And here's what I notice so much about this story is there is a very clear division in the story, isn't there? There are really two opposing groups of people. We have our magi that we're going to talk about. And we have Herod and the religious leaders who are absolutely apathetic and opposed to Jesus. But isn't that the way that it always is with Jesus? Time and time again in Matthew's gospel, he will highlight that there are two competing camps of people, one full of praise and welcome and the other full of hatred and opposition. And although these religious leaders knew very well where the Messiah was going to be born, they did not take the time. They did not invest the effort to go a few miles to check things out. I was telling my Bible study group this morning, like, let's just stop at that for a minute, because be like, oh, you bad religious leaders. But how often do we in our lives not even want to do the first thing to do what God has asked us to do. To worship the king who is worthy of all of our worship. <clears throat> These religious leaders' eyes were not wide open to the wonder of God. They lacked the determination that these wise men did one group went hundreds and even possibly a thousand plus miles and many months of trial, travel to see this king of the Jews. The other couldn't even be bothered to go a few. The Magi literally walked for probably what is estimated to be about nine months. And they weren't on nice paved roads and they didn't have nice comfy cars. They were sleeping in tents and had sand in their ears and up their nose over a thousand miles, but that is the point, guys. That's what I want to emphasize. The story of the Magi is all about one word. Grit. Determination. Fortitude. Perseverance and anything. Theologian Michael Green says it this way. Is it not absolutely astonishing that men with so little to go on should venture so far and endure such hardships and travel and face such uncertainties as finding the one the star promised. What is more, they wanted to give him costly gifts and the worship of their hearts. Over a thousand miles and what is the first thing they do when they see this child? For guys who were bigwigs in their society, who had it all going on, the only thing that they can do is to bow and to worship the king. I want to think about this idea and this word of grit for just a minute. The definition of grit in the context of our behavior is firmness of character, indomitable spirit. Paul talks in his letters often about the necessity of us enduring or continuing in determination no matter the obstacles that try to trip us up. Philippians chapter 3, Paul has this very familiar uh, passage. We've read so many times, but it speaks into this Christmas story and into the Magi. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved perfection or these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on 
to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Does that sound a whole lot like grit? Nothing's stopping me. I'm going all the way to the end. There's a woman by the name of Angela Duckworth who wrote a book called Grit, The Power and Passion of Perseverance. And she describes grit in this way, and it sounds a whole lot to me like the journey of faith, of these magi. She says grit is having stamina and sticking with your future. Day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years and working really hard to make that future a reality. And and, and what's really interesting is I've read a little bit about this book that she reads is this essence or this foundation of where we get our grit or where we get our gumption from is very elusive to Duckworth. She says, I don't know. I don't know what gives us grit. I don't know what makes us keep going. I don't know what makes us more determined. Lucky for us, though. Scripture is very, very rich in explaining the source of our striving and the spirit of our stick to The Bible's terms for grit are, are steadfastness. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this in the English Standard Version, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. The Bible's terms are steadfastness and endurance. Steadfastness is the determination to remain at your post, come what may. Endurance is the determination to keep moving towards your desired goal despite external challenges and internal weariness. Biblical grit, guys, and this is the major difference. Biblical grit differs from worldly bootstrap variety grit in a very crucial way. Biblical steadfastness and biblical endurance and biblical grit has at its core a faith that rests on the promises of God and therefore is full of hope. There's this little section in Lamentations 3 and it says this about hope, about us resting on the promises of God. Lamentations 3, verses 21 through 23. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. Next. Going. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Guys, true, godly, Biblical grit is able to strive hard. It's able to stand fast because it is empowered by, and don't miss this word. It is the other part of this equation. It is empowered by God's grace. It's grit and grace. Biblical grit is not genetic. It's not something you're born with. It is an acquired character trait. You build it up. True grit, true biblical grit is forged in the fires of adversity and challenge and trouble and suffering. That's where grit truly comes from. So when somebody can't describe it, I I know we need grit, but I don't know where it comes from. This is where it comes from. Adversity produces strong, gritty faith. Guys, let's not beat around the bush. Life is incredibly hard. It's it's harder than we often expect. Those who have gone before us in the faith have found it harder than they expected it to be. That's why the Bible says that we need grit. We absolutely need grit. 
It is only, guys, through God's grace that we can have endurance and perseverance and grit. There, there seems to be a really interesting connection between striving with endurance and perseverance and grace. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as he talks about this mixing together of the two things. 1 Corinthians 15.10 says, But whatever I am now, and Paul was a dude. Paul was a, an endurer. Whatever I am now, it is all, every single thing about me because God poured out His special favor on me. And not without results, for I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God, who was working through me by His what? Grace. Grit and determination are not pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, but being pulled forward by the power and the strength and the grace and the goodness of God. Grit and grace mixed together in a way that is inexplicable, but astonishing and powerful when it happens. And here's what I think, guys. Like, you can think all day long that I, ooh, I'll just get tougher. I'll just get grittier. I'll just be more determined. You will fail every single time. Grit, guys, only comes from the grace of a relentless and a resolute God. There is a part in Luke, Luke chapter 9 specifically, that I come across all the time and I say, this is it, man. This Jesus had grit. Luke 9.51 says this, As the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, as the time drew near for Jesus to go to his death on this earth, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He knew what he was doing, and he was determined to do it. And here is something that you need to probably write down or get from me later. But this phrase is it. The principle of grit and grace coming together is this. No amount of grit will pull you through something that you are not graced for. And no amount of grace will pull you through something that you have no grit for. You can't have one without the other. They both need to go together. Here is the main problem that so many of us myself included, have. We rely way too much on grit, independent of God's grace. You know what that's called, right? Self-sufficient. Or we rely exclusively on grace. God, do this for me. God, show up in my life. God, make me independent of grit. We are, in that case, determination deficient. We're all grit and no grace, or we're all grace and no grit. Neither, guys, is a biblical model or attitude. The Magi in Matthew 2 seem to balance both of these very well. Again, in the story, the religious leaders are very indifferent towards Jesus. They're very apathetic, and it soon turns to opposition. They know the Scripture. They point others to Jesus, but they don't go and worship Jesus themselves. They knew the Word, but they didn't obey it. The wise men in this story, the magi in the story, are anything but apathetic. They were eager and they were determined to stop at nothing before they saw the king. But what does it say again? I don't want you to miss this. Let's not just focus on like being gritty, because gritty sounds like really awesome. Like, oh, you know what? I want to be gritty. Every one of us want to walk out of here and be like, I'm going to be gritty today. I'm going to be gritty this week. Like that, stop. Stop, John Wayne, okay? Done, done. You're not a cowboy. What does it say these weary, gritty travelers do when they see the star and then they see Jesus? When they saw the star, they were filled with exceedingly great joy. And then they entered the house and they saw the child with his mother and they bowed down and they worshiped. Guys, worship, true heart-level worship 
is the only proper response when we behold Jesus. It will not do for us to see Jesus and to know Jesus and go, eh. Worship is the only proper response when we see Jesus. These men traveled thousands of miles to see the King of the Jews. They find Him. They respond with joy. They worship Him. They give gifts. This is so, so different from the approach people often take today. Some expect God to come looking for us, to explain Himself, to prove who He is, to give us gifts. But guys, the truly wise today still seek and worship Jesus for who He is, not to get anything from Him. Again, Michael Green says, I find their faith, their insight, their wholehearted search, and their adoring worship utterly amazing. It is one of the many surprises in the gospel, but then, as we said last week, what? God is a God of surprises. Matthew underlines particularly the contrasting responses to Jesus of the Magi pursuing everything to the utmost of their powers. Those wise men sought Jesus wholeheartedly with everything that they had to the ends of the earth. Then there again are the Jewish chief priests and the scribes. Their attitude is almost as amazing as that of the Magi. Amazingly horrible. They knew their scriptures inside and out. They had no problem in answering when Herod says, where is this guy supposed to be born? But they didn't go. They didn't greet this newborn king. They knew it all, and yet they did nothing. There is an ouch moment for all of us. How many of us feel like we know it all? We've heard it all. Ryan, I've heard this sermon before. I've heard about the Magi before. You know it all, but are you doing anything about it? Guys, good intentions in life have to translate into commitment and action. Again, God, make, make me. Make me into this. God, God, do this for me. God, just show up and do all the work and I just get to sit here. We sit sometimes and we wait when what we need to be doing is we need to be watching and acting. Do something with what you have. Do something with what you know, with what God has revealed to you. Grit does not just sit and wait around. Grit depends on God. I guess it really is true with the story of the Magi, the old saying that the journey of a thousand miles begins what? With one single step. One single step. Guys, sometimes that's all it takes. It's all that's needed in life. When we put and we bring power and passion and God's grace together, it has this perfect storm to do some really amazing things in life. And, and, and please don't think, don't, don't, okay, I, I, what I need to do is I need to go do something really super big like the Magi. Please don't read the story and be like, I need to be like the Magi. No, you don't need to be like the Magi in everything. You don't need to do big and, and wonderful and grand things in your life. Sometimes you just need to do the, the simple things in life. You need to love people well around you. you. You need to speak the right words to the people around you. It's in every single day, in every single decision that you make. That's what requires grit and determination and perseverance from us. Sure, God will use us for, for big things along the way, but it's the small things in life that prepare us for the big things that God will do with us and show to us and ask of us. And again, sometimes that, guy, guys, that, that, that comes through adversity and struggle, but in that we get a really gritty faith. But, but why? Here's the question. You're like, wonderful. Again, grit sounds really cool, Ryan, but why? Guys, the reason that we have need of grit is that there is a promise to receive. 
Jesus has made a promise to each one of us in here and into an entire world for all of history. Eternal life. Eternity with God, our Father, and Jesus himself. As we, we are working and we are striving and we are straining towards something beyond this life that is beyond the suffering, beyond the pain, beyond the trials, beyond the challenge that we experience here and now. That's why Paul says very famously in Romans, doesn't he? I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us one day. A man by the name of John Thomas was an old Welsh preacher, and he had this line that he would constantly say. And he says this, and I'll end with this, you in your life supply the grit, and God will supply the grace. God, he was, guys, he was, he was right. We see it all over Scripture in Jesus himself, in the Magi, in, in a number of other people in Scripture. If you have the grit... God has all of the grace in the world. Would you pray with me? Lord, that's easy to say, maybe even easier to believe, that if we just had a little bit more grit in our life, things would go a whole lot better. But life is tough, God. You know that well. Because you came in flesh, And you became in every way like us, to know us, to know our struggles, to know our suffering, to know our pain. There's nothing that we could ever say to you that you would say, yep, I've been there and gone through that. You know how tough life is. But you also know how that toughness can make us gritty. And so I pray for myself. I pray for all of us in here this morning. I pray for those who are watching at home, for those who will see this, Lord, that in our lives, we would become grittier in our faith. And not just so that we can work hard and try to earn something. It's not about earning something. It's about what you have done by sending your son to die on a cross for us. It is finished. It is done. There's no more work that needs to happen, but Lord, you do expect us to work out that redemption and that salvation. And I pray that when we do that, Lord, we will become more determined and more perseverant, that our faith will become stronger in you. And that all that we could ever do is we come and we behold you and we look into your face and we know your love and we know your truth and we know your grace is we would just fall on our knees and we would love you and worship you and adore you. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. I'm going to sing a song right now that's going to be a little bit more upbeat, but it's going to sing all about the king that we worship. So if you get on your feet right now and worship.